Man, so excited to have you guys here. Thank you for being with us. My voice has been fine all day. Now it's trying to go. Just tells me we got something to say. I didn't come to church. I came to have church today. I'm just going to warn you. So if you need to buggle up, buggle up. We're wrapping up a series on miracles. Sometimes you just got to preach a little, you know. My great grandfather, that was his gifting. He was a preacher. Do the teaching in Sunday school. Do the preaching on the platform. That's how church used to be, you know. Learned about Jesus on a felt board. Felt Jesus in the sanctuary. That's how it was. Been in this series. I've been loving it. We're coming to an end because all good series must come to an end. A few years back, I was over in Cherokee County, Oklahoma. I was trying a case. I was coming up against a guy that I had heard all about. You see, in the lawyer world, it's a small circle. So if you're going to try a case against a guy, you ask some questions about him. You want to know how good he is, how talented he is, how skilled he is. Does he have certain tendencies? It's kind of like game film for a football coach. You know, I want to know what my opposition is going to bring to the table. And clearly he had done the same about me. And uh, just a short time prior to that, I had tried a case against this guy's brother. And he had given me the nickname Clark Kent. Now listen, I wasn't quite as healthy then. I had zero gray hairs and my glasses were just a little bit bigger, as hard as that is to believe. And so I come into the courtroom and he says, hey, Clark Kent. I said, yeah. He said, I thought you'd be bigger. And that was gamesmanship on the part of this savvy old trial lawyer. Now, fortunately for me, we tried a case for three days. And at the end of it, I got a guilty verdict as a prosecutor, a.k.a. I won. Now, it wasn't because I was a better lawyer than him, because I was not and I am not and I will never be. But my facts were really good and the law was on my side. And sometimes your case is just too good to lose. I knew this, but still yet at the end of the trial, as we were walking out, all I could remember was him saying, hey, Clark Kent, I thought you would be bigger. So I looked at him and I said, hey, Donnie, I thought you'd be smarter. <laughs> and the two of us have been great friends ever since. You know, I think about the purpose of this entire series and it's miracles, and it's the miracles of Jesus, but that's not really the purpose. Okay, the purpose is to inform us about the miracle working power of our God, but the purpose is to get us not to seek miracles, but to seek Jesus. It's been the theme of the entire series, and it's what I hope we leave this series actually doing, because it's in the moments that we seek Jesus that we receive miracles. It's when we walk close enough with him that we see the miracles begin to happen in our lives. See, I want you to see how big God really is. And I want you to see how smart he really is. And I want you to see how capable he really is because when you see him for who he is, you'll seek him. Why? Because we seek things bigger than ourselves. We seek job promotions because they'll pay us a bigger amount of money. When we move houses, very rarely do we say, I really hope that I get to buy a smaller one. We seek something bigger. And listen, we're in the South, right? Like we love big stuff. I want a big yard and a big house and a big car. Compact parking only. Take that and shove it, right? For the Yankees. We don't drive hybrids around here. We use gas because we're Americans. And we love Jesus. We've got to see God for how big he truly is. And the very first message I told you guys about the Jefferson Bible. I'll recap it for those of you that maybe weren't here. But Thomas Jefferson, the president of the United States, former president, he, he was someone that by all accounts loved the teachings of Jesus. But he was a child of enlightenment, meaning logic was Lord. That's what mattered most to him. And so in the Library of Congress, there is a Bible called the Jefferson Bible because what Thomas Jefferson had done is he went through the entire New Testament and he took all of the 34 miracles and he cut them out of the Bible. 
and he removed the miracles because logically they just didn't make sense to him. We all have a certain tendency to explain away that which we cannot explain. Because we want an answer. We want to know what it is. We want to be able to point our fingers. So we'll explain away a miracle so as to not say that we were a part of a miracle. And then you think about cutting your Bible up. And many of you inevitably would sit in the auditorium today and be like, I would, I just I can't, can't believe he did that. I can't believe he did that. Yeah, we do it in our everyday walk of faith. We don't physically remove the miracles from the Bible, but in our faith walk, we remove them because we no longer believe them. Every dream you give up on, every hope you let go of, every time you stop praying for something that was put on your heart, you are cutting a miracle out of your Bible. You're giving up on God. The purpose of this series was just to make really, really clear the God that merged church serves, who we believe in, listen, that Jefferson Bible is logical and it leaves Jesus, but it leaves a very wise yet weak Jesus. And that isn't the Jesus that we're coming to celebrate. That isn't why we lift a loud voice. That isn't why we sing songs and we clap our hands. That isn't why we come to an altar and get on our knees. It isn't why we're faithful and we give. We're faithful and we give because we serve the God of miracles, the God of the impossible, the one that created the entire universe with four simple words, let there be light. The one that can make the sun stand still and can part the rivers. The one that can raise the body of the dead, that can heal the blind, that can make the deaf man hear again. That's the God that we serve. And if we give up on that, what are we doing? You can get better information on the internet. The reason we come together as a local church is because we believe in transformation. Information isn't enough. It's the starting point. It's the transformation that occurs when we step into true faith and we say, I'm not going to let my logical brain limit the possibilities of God. Easy to say on Sunday, hard to live on Monday. Hard to live on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. But you see, the problem with scrubbing out all of the miracle working power of our God, the problem with making logical that which is supernatural is that it isn't seeking the real Jesus. It's inviting Jesus to be a part of us. When we truly seek God, we seek him in his fullness, in all that he is, which is far bigger and far greater than we are. 2 Timothy 3 and 5 says this. There are those who have an outward religion, but they repudiate the power thereof. Got an outward religion, but I repudiate the power of my faith, of my belief, of my relationship with the true Jesus. 1 Corinthians 4 and 20 says this. The kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power and not just power, wonder working power. Don't you want to sing that song now? Some of you know what I'm talking about. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. Three of you grew up Pentecostal. Only three people knew to sing that second part with me. That's what I'm talking about. There's wonder working power in our God. We have to seek Jesus. But why is it so hard? Why is it so hard to seek Jesus when we truly need something? I believe this. When we reach the need for a miracle, we instinctively wish we could reverse the course and correct whatever mistake we made that led us to the point of needing the miracle. When we find out that we're sick, we wish we would have taken better care of ourselves and exercised and eaten broccoli. When we find out that our spouse wants to leave us, we all of a sudden really wish we would have paid attention and bought that anniversary gift and sent her some flowers and loved on her a little bit. When we lose our job, a lot of times we go, oh man, I just, I wish I would have done it a little differently, put in a little more effort. But here's the truth. We cannot unbake cookies. We cannot uncut hair. We cannot put the toothpaste back in the tube. 
Seeking God is a forward movement, not a backward direction. Ben, my youngest, he loves to play basketball, like really loves it. He has a basketball goal in the living room. Trying to raise a superstar here, people. I've got bills to pay. <laughs> and just the other day, he throws the basketball to Kristen, and he wants her to shoot. And I said, son. And he looks at me kind of funny. And so Kristen's going to prove me wrong because I said, son. So she shoots and misses and misses very badly, if you will. At which point in time, I sat down all three of my kids for story time. And I told him the story of their mother playing basketball way back when. And I said, did you know that your mother was a basketball player? And Carter's like, no. And Ava's like, because she knows everything. And Ben's like, why are we sitting here? I was playing basketball. One of those moments. And I said, listen, your mother scored one basketball goal in her entire two-year basketball career. She got a fast break and she was so excited and she was moving toward the goal and she shoots it. And for once in her life, it goes in on the wrong basket. <laughs> Negative two is her score in life. Negative two. Almost impossible to be that bad. I just picture eight-year-old Kristen shoots, scores, cheers. The other team's like, yeah, her team's like. <laughs> and she just wishes she would have reversed directions. Just wishes she would have gone the other way. When we reach a point where we need a miracle, it's hard to seek Jesus because our nature says, go back and fix what you messed up. But seeking God says, move forward and I'll make a new way. I'll give you a new life. I'll give you a new hope and a new joy and a new mercy. You've got to keep moving forward to seek Jesus. But we get this feeling when we face these giants in our lives that doctor's report that we didn't want to hear, the termination from our boss, the divorce papers that we got in the mail, the lawsuit that we just was hoping would never come. You know the feeling that I'm talking about, just that gut-wrenching, overwhelming, you don't know what to do. They told you they didn't make it. And you don't know where to turn or what to do. That's how Mary and Martha felt in the book of John chapter 11. Picking up at verse one, it says, now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister, Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Number one, to seek Jesus, never put a comma where God puts a period and never put a period where God puts a comma. I was working with Collier. He's in first grade now. They have homework in first grade, by the way. If you're a first grade teacher, let's have a meeting after this. I got three kids. I'll be available. Don't worry. <laughs> Just want to talk. Love on you a little bit. Encourage you not to send homework home and the whatnot. But he comes home and he has this writing assignment. This is super early in the school year. He's made a lot of progress because we do homework. And he's writing a story, right? And he's like, the period, day period is period. And I'm like, son, what are you doing? He's like, well, I'm using punctuation. We learned about it at school. Now the, <laughs> did you know there's more forms of punctuations than periods? He said, well, no, we just got to periods. I said, well, son, they don't go after every word. He's like, oh. And you see the progression as he learns to write a little bit better and he learns to use some periods and some commas. And one day, hopefully, he'll be smart enough to use some semicolons and some colons and all of that good stuff. And, and his punctuation will continue to grow so that the emphasis of his writing will be where it's supposed to be. In our faith life, many of us never get past day one of first grade and all we know about is the period. Oftentimes in our life, a, a no from God isn't a no, it's a not yet. It's a just hold on a little while. I got some things that I need you to learn about. Stop putting periods where God puts commas. 
Lazarus was dead for four days. That's where we put the period. Boop, he dead. <laughs> Moving on now, right? But not Jesus. We all hit spots in our lives where we think it's over. Relationship ends. Life savings is gone. It feels like it's over. I love what Oswald Chambers said. He said, sometimes it looks like God is missing the mark because we are too short sighted to see what he's aiming for. We think he missed. The truth is we can't see far enough to understand what he's aiming at. And sometimes God lets us come to the end of ourselves so we can come into his greater plan. We come to the end of ourselves because he wants to reveal more of himself to us. He wants our dependence to shift and move somewhere else. But God didn't put a period on the life of Lazarus. Historically, if you look it up, there's two traditions that the church offers of what happens to Lazarus later on. Number one is that he moved to the island of Cyprus where he became a bishop. And number two is that Lazarus and his sisters ended up in France, but he eventually died from a beheading. I don't know if either one of those are true. I have no idea. But what I do know is that Lazarus lived a second life. He got a second shot. There wasn't a period put on his life. It was just a comma of what was to come. We have to stop putting periods where God wants to put a comma because the truth of it is God intended us to live two lives. We have a life when we're living in sin and we don't yet know Jesus. We've never met him. We've never accepted him. We've never believed in him. And then one day we just speak what our heart believes and we say, I believe in you, Jesus. And new life is given. We move into a new life. The Greek word for that means a life that will not end. It says, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly, that you may have a life that will not end. Quantitatively, forget living to 80 or 90 or 100. It's forever. It's eternity. Qualitatively, what it means is you live life more abundantly with more joy and more peace and more mercy and more grace. When we stick periods where God puts commas, we miss out on all of the qualitative goodness that he has given us. Verse 17 says, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. I wonder why Jesus waited. I wonder why he waited four days. Why didn't he just heal him? Why didn't he just take care of it while he was sick? You see, Jesus had already revealed his healing power. It was time for Jesus to reveal his resurrection power. He needed Lazarus to be dead. He needed Lazarus to come to the end of himself so that God could show more of himself. Write this down. To seek Jesus is to know it's always too soon to give up hope. Verse 21 says this, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Martha's kind of passive aggressive, right? <laughs> like, Jesus, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. Thanks. Good work, man. You showed up late. Now I don't know what to do with you anymore. Y'all ever passive aggressive with Jesus? I'm sometimes real passive aggressive with Jesus. You know, and I thought about why. Like, why am I passive aggressive with Jesus? And I'm passive aggressive with Jesus because I know that Jesus could prevent me from ever suffering anything if he wanted to. So I get in these situations and I become a little passive aggressive with him because I think, why don't you take care of this? And why don't you fix this? And why don't you do something about it? But there's a conjunction in this sentence. Conjunction, junction, what's your function? Wish they still had that show so I'd have to quit doing homework with my son. <laughs> says, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but... And what follows is amazing display of faith. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. It's been dead four days. And she's still holding out hope. 
He's been dead, not sick, didn't stub his toe, not just unsure of what the next step is. Dude is dead. He's gone. And she still has the faith to hold out hope that Jesus can come and that God will give him anything he asks. It's always too soon to give up. See, Martha didn't put a period there. She just put a comma. Number three, write this down. To see Jesus, you've got to put your reputation on the line. You think, why? Because he did. If we jump to the end of the story, verse 43, it says, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. See, we automatically read this story. And if you've been in church or, or maybe even if you haven't, I think I've made it pretty clear that like Lazarus does in fact rise from the dead. He lives a second life. But what if he doesn't? I mean, I think about Jesus and his miracles and it feels a lot like playing ball, right? Like you're only as good as your last performance. You're only as good as your last game. Michael didn't brag about the Mississippi State Bulldogs beating the Razorbacks. Let's give it up for Michael having some humility today. I mean, come on. He's thoroughly impressed by his restraint. His loving Jesus in this moment. Look at him. But we think about it and it's one of these situations and it's one of these circumstances where if Jesus says, hey, come on out, and Lazarus doesn't, he's risked everything. He put his entire reputation on the line because death is the ultimate end in the eyes of those of us that are on this earth. What he's saying is, I can raise someone, I have resurrection power. If he's wrong, he has forfeited everything he's supposed to to be. Like, yeah, but he's Jesus. Like he, he knew what he had. You see, no, he's fully human in this moment and he's fully God. Don't think for a second that a doubt didn't possibly pop up in his little Jesus brain saying, what if he doesn't? What if Lazarus doesn't hear me? And what if Lazarus is like Kristen on the basketball court and he rises, but he goes out the wrong end of the tomb and nobody sees him. What are we going to do? <laughs> And in this moment, I think about this miracle. And in Jewish burial custom, Lazarus would have actually had about 100 pounds of clothes on. His head would have been wrapped. His ankles would have been bound together with strips of linen. And his arms would have been bound to his side with the same strips of linen. I mean, just, just pure mummy in this moment, right? So he says, get up and come out. It's a miracle in and of itself that Lazarus is able to walk in this stuff before they say, take the grave clothes off the guy. He's putting his reputation on the line because he is foretelling of not only his resurrection power, but of your resurrection, of the day that you'll come to new life. If Lazarus doesn't come from the grave, Jesus isn't really the Messiah. We don't really get to the end of the story. That is, we get to receive grace and hope. He put his reputation on the line but for many of us, that's where we hit the pause button on Jesus. Jesus, I'll do anything for you as long as I don't sound crazy. I'll do anything for you as long as I don't look foolish. I'll do anything for you so long as I get to stay in the norm and the comfort that is my box. But don't call me out of it because the world, they might make fun of me. Can I tell you, if you're going to believe in the God of miracles and you're going to have that kind of faith, you're going to say some things that make you look crazy at times. You're going to do some things that just don't add up to the rest of the world. But it's your faith in operation. It's your faith in action. It's your faith in movement. If you're unwilling to look crazy, if you're unwilling to put your reputation on the line, don't ask God for miracles. Don't ask him to show up in your deepest despairs. And last point, if I could get you all up, it says to seek Jesus, you have to be intentional. You have to prioritize your energy to withstand the opposition. We live in a society today that will suck your energy. It's not time management that's the issue. It's energy management. 
We run out of energy before we run out of time. Where, where am I prioritizing my energy? 1 Corinthians 16 verses 8 and 9 says this. It's Paul writing. He says, but I'll stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost because a great door for effective work has opened to me. A great door for effective work has opened to me. And there are many who oppose me. A great door's open, but there are many that oppose me. A great door's open, but I'm blind. A great door is open, but I'm lame. A great door is open, but I'm out of wine. A great door is open, but I'm dead. A great door is open, but I got a hundred pounds of grave clothes on me. A great door is opening, but I don't know where to turn or what to do. We don't seek miracles, we seek Jesus. All you have to do is prioritize and leave yourself enough energy to seek Him. Imagine this. Imagine if we spend as much time seeking Jesus as we spend worrying. If every time we came up against a giant in our lives and the devil loves to remind us of every failure, right? Because if he can get me looking back and trying to reverse course, then I can't truly seek Jesus because that's forward movement. So all he has to do is say, remember that one time you screwed up and that one failure and the mistake that you made and all of our energy goes to the worry of correcting it. Jesus saying, I've moved on from that. Where are you? Keep up pace. We're going somewhere. You've just got to seek me. But we worry. What if he doesn't? And so I want to end with this. I, I want you all just to take a minute to think about what keeps you from seeking Jesus? Is it time? A lack of humility? Uncertainty? Doubt? Regret? Shame? Guilt? A lack of knowledge? Let me tell you, as you're thinking about that, there's an index card in your seat. I just want you to get it out and I want you to write it. See, I've got two, pride and insecurity. And you go, those two don't go together. The pride is, I've got this tendency of thinking I know better than Jesus. Well, Jesus, I went to school for 20 years. I've tried a lot of cases. I've dealt with a lot of problems. I, I can fix it. Just let me do it my way because I'll do it now. And I'll fix it the way I want it fixed. And I'll fix it using the people I want to fix it. And I'll fix it in all of the ways that make me feel good on the inside. And then it's insecurity. Because I think, what if he doesn't show up? Am I going to look foolish and crazy? Am I willing to risk my reputation and claim that my God's in the miracle working business and he doesn't do it? So you got to answer both these questions for me in one situation in my life. About three years ago now, I was practicing law day in and day out with a guy named Paul. You had to know Paul to understand the story fully, but every day I'd go into his office at the end of the day. Paul's retired, but he was at work 60 hours a week. I'd go into his office and I'd sit on a chair and he would lecture me for about an hour about everything that I needed to be doing and how I needed to be doing it and the way that I should do it. And I love those lectures and I miss them. And Paul got sick. We went from practicing law together every single day without issue, without fail, Conversation, same chair, same desk, five days a week. Same chair, same desk, five days a week. Sometimes six and seven days a week because if I worked weekends, he did too. He just sat there while I worked. Six and seven days a week, all of the wisdom and all of the insight and all of the security. And he comes home from spring break trip to New York and he says, I got cancer. And I'm in the hospital room with him as the oncologist comes in and tells him that he's gonna live three to six months. Like, how's that possible? We do life together every day. And I would go to church every single service and I would go to an altar every single service. And I would pray for a miracle. 
I didn't know what else to do. But I sought Jesus with all that I had. Everything in me I sought Jesus with over and over and over and day after day after day. I still have the journals of what I would write. And then you get the call, hey, Paul didn't make it. And he's like, where were you, God? Why didn't you show up for me? And you fast forward. And what I realized today is I stand in the middle of this miracle. And we joked about it in the green room, but the truth is it was three people, a guy that had never preached in a stinky old Methodist church building. That's what we started with. That was it. And I look at this miracle and I realize today that in all of the trips to the altar, in all of the seeking God, he gave me a miracle because he reinforced the gift he had given me and the calling he had placed on my life. You see, Paul didn't die in vain. Paul died so that lots and lots of people far from God could come to know him in and through Merch Church. When we seek God, we receive miracles that may not look like what we think they should. They may not operate in the functions we think we should. But if we'll truly seek Him, what's in your way of seeking God? Write it on this card. I'm going to pray. We're going to jump into a song. I want you to come and lay what it is getting in your way, in the way of your miracle on this altar. And I'm telling you, get on your knees and pray. Get on your knees and seek Him. Maybe for the first time in your life. When you're done, you can leave. You're free to go. Those that want to stay, we're going to stay and keep singing and keep seeking Jesus because the only thing standing between you and your miracle is your willingness to seek Him. Heavenly Father, God, we lift up Your name. And God, we give You all of the praise and the honor. And God, give us the willingness to just lay that at Your feet that is keeping us from seeking You, that's keeping us from the miracles You've called us to, that's keeping us from the new life that You've given us of hope and joy. God, we give You all of the praise and all of the honor. And everybody said, Amen. Come on.